embarrassing uh, to be invited to a, um, a forum that is called Brain and Music without really understanding much about music. So actually, I'm not, I was not invited because of my vast knowledge in music, but possibly because of my not very vast knowledge of the brain. And in fact, what I'm going to talk about is a little bit about interactions, not between the brain, but between the motor system, and, which is part of the brain, and the auditory system. And Kind of, I'll try to uh, summarize some of the findings that people, I mean, this is a long uh, research has been done on this topic, and uh, we in, in my lab, that we are studying, yes? Malasotima? Than me. Ah, okay. Okay. Ah, Lan Mich is the physics. Okay. Right. It's a bimodal distribution here, so <laughs> it's like either here or there. Ah. Okay. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is a little bit of work that sta we started in the lab. And uh, so why did we start this work at the beginning? So I had a student uh, from the ICNC that was this aerobic teacher that came to my lab and said that he's always puzzled to see these people, you know, that he has all these people coming to study aerobic in her class. And some of these people are so pathetic. And, you know, they, you tell them to move their hands to one side and they will do it to the other side. And, you know, they're always out of rhythm. And I was very silent when she talked because I didn't want to say that I am one of these pathetic people, that I have absolutely no sense of rhythm. But, you know, so she went on and on and on, and we decided to study what are the impacts of um, uh, reason, or what is reason perception in terms of the motor system. And what I'll talk about is, first I'll give some introduction, some of the basic knowledge that people have on this, in this field, and um, <coughs> then I'll talk about our work. So the student, the aerobic teacher, is uh, Mayan, that was not in our lab, and then this work was continued by Michal Frenkel, who's sitting here, and actually he's the one that knows all the details of the work. So if I miss something, he'll be here to uh, correct me. So <coughs> what I'll tell you more is a little bit about uh, auditory to motor coupling, because it, there are a lot of uh, uh, manifestation of this coupling. Uh, of course, the startle response and, and some of the non-startle response of motor response to auditory cues, so about uh, playing music, language, and rehabilitation, all of this using, uh, to some extent, the unique auditory to motor coupling. Then I'll talk about uh, the motor system and rhythmic signals, movement and time, what are the brain structures that are involved, something about motor entrainment and finger tapping, and the last two topics will be more related to what we do in the lab, and that's the impact of auditory context on low-level motor parameters and some ex experimental approach for identifying the cerebellar impact on these processes of entrainment. Okay, so uh, auditory motor uh, system are very strongly coupled, and um, we, we can see it 
very easily in our ability to respond um, uh, or to make a movement in response to auditory cues. And um, there are many, many anatomical pathways that actually serve as a substrate for this auditory to motor coupling. Okay? Some of them are subcortical, some of them transcortical, and uh, direct and indirect. And the manifestation of this coupling is very broad. And it ranges from the very primitive startle reflex to very complex movement, which people can perform, some people can perform in response to rhythmic cues. Okay? So what is a startle response? First of all, a startle response is when you know I make a very loud noise. I won't, but I can. And uh, everybody jumps. And this is what we call startle response. And startle response, first of all, it it uh, goes across species, okay? So you can have a start of response of a cat and uh, primates and humans, and it can have many different um, uh, sources. So, for example, this is a start of response. Uh, when I wrote down, you know, you have these Google images, which is very helpful for speakers in, in lectures because you immediately find examples and you write start of response, and immediately, like you know, I don't know, 20% of the picture they show you is of people uh, audience in a baseball match. And apparently, it's not uncommon for the uh, uh, pitcher or I don't know exactly who to throw a ball that will not reach the field, but the audience, and some, something like this. And what you see here is the very reasonable startle response of the audience to this uh, very fast approaching visual cue. Uh, some other things can, can evoke startle responses other circumstances, but one of the most uh, uh, prominent ways to uh, produce a startle response is a very loud auditory cue. And uh, that's what we call the acoustic startle re reflex or the auditory startle reflex. And what we get in this case is a very fast muscle response with an onset latency of about 14 milliseconds, which suggests this is not a transcortical response. This is a subcortical response through a circuitry that is very well designed to produce broad, okay, broad and effective muscle response in cases where cues, the, uh, the acoustic stimulus is uh, loud, strong enough, and it's about 80 dB. Uh, it doesn't involve any transcortical uh, processing, and the auditory input from the cochlear nucleus activates the reticular point and we're talking about these huge sinuses. I mean, this is a very secure transmission that allows the auditory stimulus to be propagated via the reticular pointer nucleus and from there via the reticular spinal pathway to motor neurons of and interneurons of the entire spinal cord. And that's why when you hear this very loud, it's not like a, the response, the motor response that is evoked is a huge massive response of the entire body, right? You, you jump, and it requires massive activation. This is a not, not a very specific uh, reflex, okay? It's a very uh, broad reflex, and uh, <coughs> it's actually very interesting. The problem, but what can you imagine the, uh, is one of the problems in studying the, the startle reflex in this, in this respect? Fast fusion, okay, or I think there is adaptation. The problem is that I can, you know, I can drop something and everybody jumps, but if I'll do it again and again and again, you know, after two or three times, you'll be accommodated. I mean, you won't respond in the same manner. That's, that's very hard for us to explore. So we know a lot about the pathways, but mostly from an anatomy and less so from um, uh, actual physiological studies of the effects in the spinal level. And this is just to show you the pathways. I won't go into this because it's not very interesting. This is just a schematic representation from the cochlear nucleus via the lateral meniscus, reticular formation, spinal cords, and muscles. There are direct and indirect pathways, but uh, this is sort of uh, the important part that this is subcortical uh, pathway. It doesn't require any cortical processing. And this is unlike the visual, okay? So the visual uh, start of response that is evoked by visual stimulation must go to the uh, cortex, right? There is no direct subcortical connect connection between the visual system and the motor system. So in a sense, the, there is a unique, there is a unique uh, interaction between auditory
story in the model system that are mediated subcortically. It's something that is unique for sensory motor uh, connection. Okay? Yeah. So, so how, uh, how slow is the visual stabilization? Uh, I, I don't have the number, but uh, so I think, no, I'm trying to think. There is the work of uh, Simon Thorpe. Yeah, that's 180 minutes. Yeah, so it's like, I think 130 or 180, I mean, this is something, it's much uh, slower, okay? So it's like, because it requires some more processing. Yeah, but I mean, uh, almost one third of the EEG is simply processing in high, high substantially slower than the real. Yeah. It yeah. takes uh, 50, 60 milliseconds if you want to get out of the eye. Yeah. Okay. So what is the delay inside the ear? Sorry? some non-startle motor response to auditory stimulation. And uh, uh, in generally, auditory cues also modify spinal reflexes. And uh, uh, the time scale of this, uh, so in response to auditory, if, if we measure a very uh, simple reflex, like the H reflex, okay, so you may know that you know, you go to the doctor and gives you like a, a knock, you know, knocks your knees and jumps, right? This is the basic, very basic H reflex, which is a completely spinal, purely spinal reflex, right? Still, if you, in response to auditory cues, there will be modulation of spinal reflexes, okay? And the modulation are at the same time scale as the startle response. So the assumption is that startle reflex, in, uh, in response to very loud auditory cue, we get a startle response. But if the auditory cue is not as loud as, the, as required for startle response, we still get sub-threshold facilitation of the motor system via the same circuitry, okay? And uh, so we can have a facilitation of reflexes in response to auditory cues, and we can have a actually modification of motor cortical activity in response to auditory cues. And uh, the facilitation of the reflexes are very similar uh, to the, uh, in time scale to the startle response. That is like about 10 to 20 milliseconds. We can see in the head-related motor cortex in, in humans, we can see a suppression, a transient suppression in response to unexpected auditory stimulus. But of course, the processing time is a little bit longer. It's 30 to 60 milliseconds after the cue. So in addition to the start to the starter type of auditory to motor connect connection, there are also non-starter facilitation of the motor system in response to auditory cue. And what I want to talk a little bit is about several examples of this unique link between the auditory and the motor system. That is uh, <coughs> the first and the most uh, documented, maybe, coupling between the auditory and the motor system is in musicians. So, first of all, I mean, playing music is a, a actually it's, it's a result, I mean, of some sort of a coupling between a motor system and the auditory system. But if you if you ask professional musicians, they will tell you that once they hear a piece of music they practice for, they will perform involuntarily hand movements that are actually uh, used to generate this piece of music. So this is not like people when they imagine, uh, you know, when uh, you can imagine playing a piece of music. The, the activation is very different. Here it's something, it's a link. The auditor listening to a, mu to a piece of music uh, actually causes activation of motor-related areas and generates muscle activity that is uniquely linked to this specific piece of music. Uh, <coughs> so the motor, uh, uh, the motor accessibility is increased for rehearsed but not for non-rehearsed pieces. And also silent tapping of musical uh, pieces, so if you give them uh, non-working piano, 
piano and ask people to just sort of play, silently play the piece of music, you can see activation of auditory uh, uh, areas of the cortex. So there is some sort of a link that suggests that for at least professional musicians, a piece of music is a, uh, is a very broad um, object that includes both the auditory part of it, but also the motor. And these two, ob uh, these two parts are well linked, again, for professional musicians. Yes? Uh, what about thinking about the composer? So, so actually, I mean, uh, the audi this auditory motor loop is not involved during imagined performance in musicians. So again, I think there is some activation of auditory areas when you imagine, but it doesn't generate the same auditory to motor uh, loop or uh, connectivity that is being uh, invoked when you uh, when you are talking about very specific piece of music. And in this case, it's sufficient. If you listen, you get a very specific motor activation. If you make the motor part you will also activate the auditory part. So this is, uh, imagining things is, is, a, is a very different type of brain activation. It is not as specific as what, uh, as the object, the musical objects you can call it, that are being invoked in this type of circumstance. So, <coughs> so the idea is that the, this recurrent co-activation of auditory part and motor part actually links to a functional link between the auditory representation and the primary motor cortex. So, um, in this respect, we are talking about a very clear coupling between the two systems. Auditory perception leads to motor activation. Yes, please. Oh. What about writing? Oh, pff, uh, yeah, I don't know if, uh, I mean, this is actually very interesting. I mean, whether oh, when you write a music, you can... Reading, reading and, uh, yeah. It's true. Uh, okay, so in this uh, case, and what I'm talking about is examples of auditory to motor coupling. And here, w w what I'm saying is that listening to the music and producing the music, the same music, are actually very tightly linked. Now, possibly, and I, I don't know, for um, a composer to write and to hear may be also linked. I mean, this is something that I don't know. I mean, maybe you want to hear notes, but... I don't know any, of any study of that sort, but I think that in, in principle, this is very different. I, I would, I would say so, yeah. There is some transformation. Yes, yes. You have the timing that, that couples the yeah. auditory part and the motor part, which you won't have when you're doing something like writing. Yeah, yeah. So the, 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 the internal headphone. listening. Yeah. Sorry? Internal listening. be vivid, but it's not necessarily will induce the same motor output that is required. I mean, here, I think the time, the time, uh, I think what Ronnie said is actually very important because the time aspect the, the is very is common here between the, uh, uh, here, the piece that you listen to and the motor output. There is the tempo that is actually no, made, but made but in, in binding. In music, music that you, you, yeah. you hear in your mind when you read music, be almost maybe okay. also can ge uh, generate yeah. activation, auditory yeah. activation. So, so in the work that yeah. the there I read, some fMRI yeah. experiments about that. Uh, I think it generally shows that the, 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 the areas uh, activated in imagining music and uh, listening to music in terms of the brain activity are quite similar. It's, it's no, please. This is different. Yeah. I mean, uh, imagining music can activate auditory areas. Yeah. 
and then you have like a broad uh, first step because it, it uh, contains both auditory and motor parts. And, and, and I think it's mostly soft motion. No, no. Here it's cortical. No, that's definitely cortical. Yes, but I will go back to the subcortical first uh, aspect of this. Yes. So is there a difference between rhythmic and non-rhythmic? Yes, because this type of cultivation of functional links is being generated after practice. I mean, okay, y unless you are a bad musician, I mean, it's not necessarily a, not necessarily a good musician, <laughs> but uh, I think it's being generated after practicing. I think that's, that's I think, is the, the point here. the hand movement, moving. I mean, so you see that the, there is an involuntary movement of the finger as required to generate the same <coughs> of music. And when you make the movement... No, 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 no. This is a different... Uh, okay. Ah, whether there was... Uh, if you see someone else making the movement, whether... I mean, this is... I mean, I think that you may expect to, I, mean, uh, I, I will speculate here, but you may, may expect by uh, making movement to, to see some uh, uh, activation of high order auditory areas, but not primary auditory areas that are supposedly active when you hear something. You know, they are supposed to be driven by the periphery. To say that if you see activity there when you make movement, that means that there is some coupling. I mean, how it is being obtained by down or other types of sources, that's, that's a different story. But it's like, it's not just high order uh, cortical areas that are being lit up by this type of uh, silent tapping. It's actually low level auditory areas that are being uh, engaged here as well. And which suggests that there is some linking here. Okay, but, so <coughs> the other uh, example, so this is one example. Professional uh, musician, they form this strong link between auditory and motor output. Other type of links that was suggested is that uh, uh, was during uh, speech, okay? Again, for speech, I mean, listening to uh, people speak actually feed the, uh, or the auditory part of these uh, areas, the speech-related areas, feed to the parts of the brain that are responsible for motor execution. So there is some sort of a recurrent activation of areas, brain areas that are related to uh, speech perception and uh, speech production, okay? And in this way, and th there is recurrent activation. So the production areas also feed back to the perceptive areas, and in a way, we think that actually a acti co-activation of these two areas during, when we listen to, to speech, okay, 
when we listen to speech, we are definitely don't not require to repeat. I mean, it's, it's helpful to repeat what we are saying, what uh, what we listen to, but it's not uh, obligatory. But act, it's it's considered as activating a speech production area when we listen to speech help us to understand, the, to perceive what was what has been said. Okay, so again, there is a linkage between. Uh, the auditory part and the motor part in speech, and it's considered to be a unique linkage that is part where the both areas are part of these uh, perception, part of the per perception of, of uh, speech. And that's kind of something interesting because, I, I mean, I don't know, usually, again, uh, we can, we, we think about uh, perception and action and they're not necessarily uh, coupled in such a strong way. I mean, no, of course. No, no, no. And, well, I mean, I, I would say that they are coupled in some way, in some cases, more than in others. So speech is a, is an example of a very strong coupling. And there are some uh, evidence, and I would just uh, uh, I won't go too much. I mean, there is uh, like uh, uh, the work of Rizolatti that actually uh, activation of speech-related muscles when during the perception of speech. Okay, so this is not just areas. Uh, of the brain that are being active, muscles themselves are being active when we listen to someone speak, et cetera, et cetera, and there is some, again, some several evidence suggesting that there is auditory motor coupling unique during speech. The other, uh, the last thing that I will mention here is that uh, people try to use this auditory to motor coupling for rehabilitation, and the idea is that uh, we can, I mean, for people that suffer from some sort of uh, a, a <coughs> motor disabilities, like, you know, for example, in, in Parkinson's disease or in other uh, traumatic brain injuries or strokes, we can actually use rhythm, uh, rhythmic movement as a, as a way to, for compensating for the motor loss. So uh, they, they, people have shown in some cases that rhythmic auditory rhythmic training, so you, you let people make rhythmic movement in response to auditory cues, and in this way, you actually, uh, uh, in some, to some extent, okay, of course, this is not like that, but you, you are able to recover some of the motor deficit. Mm -hmm. And the recovery is not only in rhythmic movement, like gait, okay, but also in, in just reaching movement. So you actually use this link between the auditory and the motor system in order to allow some um, a training or, or rehabilitation of the motor system in case of a, of a loss, of a motor loss. Okay, but <coughs> what, I'm, what we are interested in in our lab is actually how the motor uh, system is being activated during rhythmic movement, not just auditory or, or sort of always rhythm, but some very simple rhythmic movement. And this is just an example, I mean, of two people that are, are able, okay, this is uh, Fred Astaire and Lindsay Rogers, and they are, they were, I mean, it was shown from, from many movies that they are able to use auditory, rhythmic auditory cues for very fine motor performance. Of course, uh, in the lab, we are not trying this type of uh, activity, although I, I encourage you all to see any of their movies, I mean, but I think specifically Swing Time, which is really perfect, I mean, you see them dancing, it, it's really, non-human, I think, I mean, for me at least. So. But, anyway, uh, okay, so movement in general it has some temporal aspect. In order to make movement, it has some uh, temporal dimension to it. We need to be uh, precise, we need to be coordinated. In all these uh, respects, we need to, uh, there is some temporal properties for the movement, and people have shown that any type of reaching movement has some temporal property. But when we ask persons to generate a rhythmic movement, we add one th more temporal dimension to it. It's not only that you have to be precise, but you also have to be uh, um, synchronized with some externally uh, 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 timing machine or, or some cue, some well-timed cue. So you need uh, to have a link between what we call the internal timekeeper, our machinery that allows us to generate rhythmic movement, and the internal model of the movement. Because we think that every movement, to generate movement, we need to have some internal model that has some temporal properties to it, and we need to add to this the timekeeping uh, dimension in order to be able to respond in uh, synchrony to some rhythmic movement. And so 
so there is uh, the movement of the slant, for example, the hands, okay, uh, follows not only the kinematic and dynamic parameters of the internal model, but also it has to respect some actual time, okay, because we need to make the movement every so and so millisecond, something like this. So, in order to do this, there are several brain structures that are helping us to be able to generate rhythmic movement. And I would. Yeah, but there is some more to it. So, for example, I mean, uh, there is some uh, isochronic uh, aspect to movement. So, if you make a ballistic movement, uh, if you make the amplitude larger, you will have to make it faster because the time of ballistic movement is usually constant. So, you you scale uh, amplitude and velocity. So, there is some other properties of temporal properties that are beyond just the the temporal properties of the muscle, but of course, I mean, generally speaking, I mean, what you are saying, right, there is some inherent timing to movement because of uh, the, the spring properties. This, this change in time. Exactly. No, 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 I know, but, uh, but there is, but, so the, of course movement is change of time, but there is, uh, and there, you need to take into account the mass of the hand and the spring properties of the muscles and the length of the hand and so, uh, and so on and so forth. But these are properties that our system is easily uh, solving on a daily on a daily basis. But when you need, I mean, this is part of the what we call the internal model of, of, of the movement. Okay, so, uh, but when we, you need to make movement in a rhythmic in response to rhythmic cues, you you see that you generate yet another time dimension, which is the absolute time. You know exactly when it, you need to make the movement, and you will make it at that time, okay? which is not related to the mass. It's not related to any properties of the plan. Okay? This is something which is absolute time. And some machine in the brain needs to keep this absolute time. Okay? So that's what I'm trying to say, that there is, okay? Well, internal clock, which is independent of the, the internal clock is not independent of No, no, no. Um, but, uh, but there is an auditory system. Uh, I'm yeah. just pointing out that the, the mechanism is very different from a clock for a metronome. And the, the, met the, the metaphor of a metronome of the clock is an EBD. And I'm going to show next uh, lesson in this course evidence that shows that the, met the, the, met the metaphor is, is very misleading. So, uh, so, so. Okay, so I'm the metaphor of okay. the clock and the metaphor okay, of the but, but okay, I, th I, th I think that here I'm talking to people that have some prior uh, knowledge or and concept prejudice. about prejudice. And I will show the data that we have, not the data, what people have found to, to suggest that there is some sort of a timing machine, okay? Timing but machine, yes, but not an internal timekeeper or, or a metronome or well, you a know, clock. Yeah, kind of, uh, well, we, we can argue about this later. But the brain, what are the areas of the brain that are responsible for, okay, timekeeping, I'm sorry, <laughs> like, uh, I'll have to use this because I don't have any other better term, but I'll come next week and maybe I'll come up with a better term next week. Okay, so one of the, the cerebellum is one of the most prominent uh, brain structure that is responsible for time. And we know that, uh, first of all, we think that it is a internal timing system, okay, I hope, uh, uh, in a range of milliseconds to seconds. And it provides a representation of the interval to be timed in motor and non-motor tasks. Okay, it's a general timekeeping, not like a, a whatever, timekeeping machine. Okay, we know, it, uh, we know that when the cerebellum is damaged, uh, the onset, the, the reaction time, the onset of the movement, and the coordination, which is also required some sort of timing, is uh, affected. And we think that the cerebellum is both uh, keeping the, uh, the internal model, which has some time properties, and that's why 
Uh, the movement uh, tra uh, times the trajectory is in coordination of damage when the cerebellum is damaged, but also has some more uh, role in, in uh, keeping more absolute time than And I'll show you in a second what I mean by that. The other structure that is involved in the, in the uh, timing is the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia are also linked to time of actions, but in the range of seconds and minutes. So this is a long, uh, long range type of uh, time keeping machine. I feel uncomfortable every time I say time keeping, but next week we'll all be smarter and uh, I will use it for now. So again, so damage to the basal ganglia, also slow voluntary movement and frequently is the result in uncontrolled movement. So generally speaking, timing and movement are co-linked here and it's very difficult to understand whether there is any separation between these two in these brain areas, okay? Other parts that are um, <coughs> responsible or taking part in our ability to generate rhythmic movement are, yeah, I mean, you take a person, you ask him to make a rhythmic movement, you put it in the scan, okay, in MRI or PET scan, and you see that large areas of the brain are being lit up during this type of sensory and the motor cortex and the cingulate and the, sub, uh, the cingulate is how the supplementary motor cortex, the dorsal lateral premotor cortex and so on and so forth and these are all cortical areas and also some uh, uh, other areas of the brain are being lit up during rhythmic action. So, <coughs> so we are able uh, to make a rhythmic movement and when the we are making such rhythmic movement. There is a very unique pattern of activation almost all over the brain. But uh, we are interested not just with not simple rhythmic movement like uh, cell space, but rhythmic movement that are being cued by auditory rhythmic auditory cues. And uh, uh, we we looking at the auditory cue because this cue auditory cue has a very powerful impact on the motor system. And auditory cues first it's uh, induce faster reaction time compared to visual or tactile cues, and this is, we're talking about 20 to 50 milliseconds. The perception and the production of movement in response to rhythmic auditory cues are more accurate and more stable. And uh, again, I mean, if you, uh, any of you, if you go, uh, that's another, you know, we always get some, uh, or understanding of the brain while you explore yourself. So uh, you go to the gym, okay, I went to the gym, and you know, you go to, and you start uh, running on the, on the treadmill. And it's sufficient to have a very, you know, you go to the gym, it's always this boom, 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 music type of that, uh, it's like very rhythmic music, and you immediately get entrained to this. And I, I remember that I was asking myself, how well will I be trained if I'll feel like a very rhythmic, uh, movie or and and I, I think I met uh, Ronnie many years ago and when we first started up talking this and I said you know this will be a very cool experiment you know to test how well you're being uh, trained or entrained to rhythmic auditory versus rhythmic visual and of course I was ignorant and he said oh this has been done for many years now we know that uh, we are better and more accurately and faster and trained to auditory, rhythmic auditory cues to any other, compared to any other modality, okay, visual or, or uh, sensory. And uh, also, <coughs> we can actually, f for example, if we have like a, if we ask a person to make a tapping movement, rhythmic tapping, uh, finger tapping, and we start shifting the rhythm, even if we won't hear the, the change in rhythm, people will follow. We'll be able to follow the new, the change in rhythm, even if it's subconscious, okay? So the, the link between the auditor and the motor system is more accurate, I mean, in terms of uh, performing rhythmic movement, is more accurate than the conscious uh, perception of rhythm, okay? So this is why many people, I mean, uh, the most common study of rhythmic movement is in response to auditory cues. Okay, so, so I mean, I think it's a, it's a good question. I mean, we 
don't really know exactly how, I think some of it is probably also cortical because there is, you know, we think uh, that finger tapping is sort of a cortically driven command, but we are not sure. I mean, I, 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 I don't know if we know exactly the, I think there is this, uh, okay, the, the part of this circuitry is subcortical for sure, but uh, it's not clear whether it's, it's exclusively subcortical. I would say that probably it contains both subcortical and transcortical uh, components, but it's not clear what exactly, you know, the role of each of these components. So it's a long answer to say, I don't know. <laughs> Why there is an advantage? Because ah, that's because of the subcortical component of this. Because it it can retrieve information that is it the motor system can retrieve auditory information that is more precise, more accurate than the the temporal information that is available consciously. Okay, so that's kind of uh, I mean of course how can, how do we retrieve this information? I mean we can say it in the very uh, nice word, but how, how exactly it's being done, this is not clear. But that's definitely, and, and um, so this is exactly what I, what I write here, that uh, there is special, okay, when we say special, it means we don't know exactly which, I mean, but there are special auditory to motor connection that permit the motor system to receive information that is more accurate than that of conscious auditory temporal decision. So in some way, the auditory system, we are possibly subcortical pathway, I mean, deliver information, temporal information that is available to the motor system, but not to auditory perception, okay? So that makes it unique. It's not like this for visual system. We cannot be more precise than our visual perception in a rhythmic motor, okay? And there is, basically, there is a unique, and we think subconscious motor sensitivity to auditory information and we think that this, the reason for this is some sort of uh, uh, survival uh, advantages for, for like, but it's not clear. Again, this is not exactly known. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So is this, is this, so how do we do here? I mean, do we have a break or we don't or we continue? I mean, it's up to you guys or it's up Usually to we do. Sorry? Usually we have a break. Usually, Usually we have a break. Within the next uh, okay, so you know, I'll finish the motor entrainment, and uh, the other part that is makes it very interesting, the, the entrainment of motor action to rhythmic auditory cue, is that it is considered to be unique uh, to humans. We don't find it in <coughs> uh, animals. I mean, so what do we mean by that? So first of all, primates can distinguish between different pitch, but they will not it's not clear, I mean, recently there was a paper, but it's not clear uh, <coughs> you know, whether they can distinguish between different rhythms. And in generally, I mean, you put some rhythmic music or rhythmic sounds to humans or to children, and they will start move, you know, most of, most of people will start move according to the rhythm. Animals will not do it continuously. I mean, we may, might be able to train them, but uh, uh, it's not a natural property. And it, sorry? Ah, birds. Ah, actually, that's very interesting. I have a slide exactly on that, but it's only after. This is a very interesting point. Yes. So you're saying that uh, it's uh, based on the music, so it's in, in the tone, but they are they similar? Yeah, primates. I mean, I think they have similar auditory capabilities as, as we yeah, do. They so. have absolute hearing. Or yeah. Well, I mean, better than us. Well, hopefully, I mean, the animals in our life, you know, they kind of, they're being exposed to the same noisy <laughs> environment, and I think the hearing is probably as bad as ours, but, uh, I mean, but you're right, I mean, but they don't, they might be better, but they uh, definitely don't move in. Rhythmic music doesn't invoke the same response in animals as it does in humans, okay? And uh, that's, that's a very good thing. And I think one of the main things is that it is considered that the, what they miss is the part of the prediction, okay? When you give a rhythmic uh, cue, just for a second, if you give a rhythmic cue to human, you give him one or two uh, <coughs> uh, 
tone, and they will immediately generate a good prediction of when will be the next tone. And something like this, this prediction, and I'll talk about it uh, very soon in more detail, this is something that it seems that primates are incapable. It's not clear whether they can or not, but so far no study has shown that they are capable of generating this prediction that is required for rhythm perception. Mm -hmm. But how, how would you get it? Well, I mean, I, I, I have an experiment. Maybe it's not holding its hands and you want No, to I mean, you give them, okay, so, uh, I, I have, a, I have an a, a exact uh, way to, you know, exact slide that shows this point of, uh, you know. Because the the idea is that you give. a surprise. Right? No, but for example, you give them, um, re, uh, uh, some uh, isoconus uh, uh, signal. And you see what, what is the reaction time to the signal. They have to respond to, to the beat. And the question is, humans very fast will come predicting, right? In two, two to three uh, cues, they will be predictive in 50 milliseconds. The idea is that possibly primates will always lag behind. Behind the, the one experiment that shows that. There is one experiment. But the, the Mexican guy that shows Yeah, but this is such a complicated uh, thing that very difficult to understand what the primates actually learn from that experiment. I think we need to have a simple experiment. Take a uh, monkey, tell him, okay, one, two, three, four, and they will generate maybe, um, you know, I, I don't know why you... They do continuation testing. In the experiment, there is one... Yeah, there is a continuation. continuation. But the continuation is not necessarily similar to generating a prediction, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit different, I think. They can generate... They, they do have a sense of time, but synchronize... The negative asynchrony is something that I haven't seen in, in animals, so except of one case, which I'm sure you can say. Is, is there anything similar to the uh, alternating tone experiment with Elise that you sketch in, in rhythm? Right? So I can, I can see there is a prediction, but I'm supposed to be disturbed or surprised by the misalignment of the timing. Yeah, you, you, uh, you, s that, you tell me that, that there was? my experiment. Right? Ah. Just measure the auditory surprise but not in frequency, but in time. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, done in animals or in, in animals? Mm -hmm. So I, I, in theory, the, the Mexican experiment that did a lot of, uh, a lot of recording can, uh, can answer it with process for analyzing. I'm not sure. He, he, he can answer that. Yeah, he can, but he, I, he I, can, I haven't he seen. He can measure it. Yeah. Right. So this, is, this is the, the purpose of this measurement. I mean, I, I don't, you know, it's independent of any, risk, any, any motor response. It's, 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 it's the, the really the, the prediction of the experiment has been done, the analysis was not correct. Yeah, I think, okay, if you look at the details of the experiment, first of all, I think few monkeys, you know, they trained like four monkeys. I, I think Michal maybe remember it better, but maybe they not. Four, <laughs> it's a complete blackout. They trained four monkeys, but they they from, but only three two, years. Yeah, but for three years, but only two were able to perform the task. The task was so complicated, and it's just like, it, it's, a, it's an example of not like a very productive. Uh, how to do it better? Yeah. Ellie. <laughs> he mentioned the cat. You simply take the old ball paradigm that we that Ellie did. Ellie and Malcolm yeah. took one. No, but it's very di it's different. And do it in time. It's you see. But this is different. The auditory. Yeah. I, I'm asking the motor system, no, not the auditory. No, but the question is, do I have a prediction? They're saying that they're what? What's the prediction? The question. The well, prediction the question is in the brain. If it's, if it's not moving, it's it's and it's hands. It's not a certain. I think it's prediction. not. I think to to. Uh, we need to make a simple, ne uh, you know, temporal, uh, you know, just mo moving, moving. Else, huh? yeah, no, but I, I want to see that, okay, uh, but I will go to this later, to what, what experiment I think should be done, but uh, that's the, okay, you had a question? Oh, no, you probably get to, okay, so uh, we can go for a short break.
אחת, שתיים, שלוש, אתם שומעים את זה, אבל שימי את זה... 
אני לא מוכן לשמוע אותך. אני מוכן לשמוע אותך. אני לא, אחר כך יבואו אליי. טוב, אני... אז אני אמשיך ו... אה, שורי, שורי. I will continue. Sort of English, right? I mean, it's like... I just want to mention that when I talk about entrainment, I mean, we... Okay, when I'm talking about movement in response to rhythmic cues or rhythmic movement, we need to distinguish between two options. The one is what we call a discontinuous task, okay? So you give a cue and the person responds. And that's what we call, uh, for this we require to keep, uh, it's called uh, event timing. So we require to respond in some time frame uh, with a discrete motor action to the cue. And this is very different than, for example, if we make a, cir a circle. Also, this is also rhythmic movement, right? If, I, if you ask a person to make circles, th there is a rhythm here, but the, the rhythm is being dictated by the movement itself. And it's a very continuous, this is what people are calling emergent timing control. And that these two, I mean, are very different control mechanisms. I mean, at least we think they are very different, the control mechanisms. And we think that the cerebellum is mostly involved in event timing control. That is generating discrete movement in response to a rhythmic cue. Okay, and that's what I will talk about from now on. And the most uh, research paradigm in this event timing in generating discrete moving in response to rhythmic auditory cue is the finger tapping. And uh, of course, we, you know, scientists, we like very simple things, and finger tapping is the most simple task we can think of, right? Because we give a very simple auditory cue, like a click or a beep or whatever, pure tone or white noise, something very simple. And we ask people to generate a very simple movement. So in this way, we can actually even put them in, uh, in the magnet in, in, and measure brain activity. And that's perfect for us. You know, we can have as many candidates as we want, right? We collect people, we put them in the magnet, and we come up with papers. And I think this is one of the reasons that uh, at least uh, uh, finger tapping became such a uh, hit in the, uh, in, in the, uh, the literature. And... Uh, uh, what we finger tapping is a discontinuous rhythmic task that relies on external explicit timing. This is an event timing, and in this type of control paradigm or of a paradigm, uh, we think the cerebellum is uh, plays a critical role. Okay, so what are the properties? So this is something that you may have heard here in this in this uh, form, but I will repeat it anyway. And uh, subjects can synchronize with rhythm in frequency between between half. Uh, hertz to 4 hertz. 4 hertz, I think it, this is sort of, uh, the, uh, for me it was the limit, but I don't know, I think it's, it's more difficult. People can also syncopate, okay, so they alternate, so you, can, you or tap between the, the, the tones. But in order to syncopate, uh, you can only do it up to 2.5 hertz, uh, and in frequency, if you ask people to syncopate, and you give them cues in higher frequencies, they will become synchronized. They will fall into synchrony. In fact, even in two hertz, I think it's very difficult to syncopate. So naive people, I mean, if you just take uh, the average student who doesn't have any drumming experiment, experience, they will have a hard time to syncopate in high frequencies, even higher than two hertz. At least, is this true? I mean, Michal, I mean, is this? Most, most subjects, me included, were... Okay, so I was about the outliers, but you see uh, experience here in this, in syncopating is very different. And we think, people think that syncopation requires a very different mechanism as opposed to uh, just rhythmic movement. So there is a, uh, in syncopation, we think there is a, a 
more uh, pronounced contribution of the motor cortex compared to cerebellar involvement in just rhythmic uh, tapping. Okay, but we will try to see if this is true later on. And uh, you give people rhythm, uh, some rhythm, uh, and they become uh, synchronized within two to three stimuli. And what do I mean by synchronized? They become predictive. They don't need to listen to hear the tone in order to make the tap. They, they actually generate the tap already 50 milliseconds ahead of time. That means they become predictive. It's what we call negative synchrony. And that's what we think is unique for humans. It was hardly found in animals. And people can also generate a stable uh, time reference because we give, we give them the uh, clicks or the, the tones to, uh, in, in a specific rhythm, and then we stop the, the tone, and they will generate still uh, the tapping in the same frequency. So, so they can continue. So they must generate some sort of a time, uh, a time frame in order to generate the rhythmic movement. And they can do it very fast in a relative robust manner. Even when the acoustic stimulus is absent or stopped at some point. So th this prediction is a really important part of, the, of, this, um, uh, of this process, and we call it anticipatory timing control. Tapping precedes the tone by several tenths of milliseconds, and this is what we call the anticipa anticipatory timing control. And the negative time offset is referred to as, okay, neg as negative uh, asynchrony. Okay, I, I forgot the word here. Okay, so it's asynchrony. Okay, and uh, the thing is that this is being generated within a specific frequency range. If we give the tones in low frequency, in a lower frequency, for example, a quarter of a hertz, subjects become reactive. So there is some sort of, a, uh, they cannot, do it below half a hertz and not above four hertz. The temporal frame is being generated within a specific uh, range of frequency. And this is actually also suggestive that the cerebellum is related to, this, to generating this time frame. Because the cerebellum is the one that is responsible to <coughs> timing of events in this time range. OK, so there is some sort of uh, the properties of our entrainment are also suggestive of a cerebral involvement. Okay. So, again, people think that this negative asynchrony is unique to humans, cannot have, uh, be found in, in animals. But, you know, again, I was looking for a nice figure, and all of a sudden, I, uh, just before this, uh, you know, uh, coming here, I found this um, um, article that was uh, published in a little bit obscure pure journal, at least to my mind, but I never heard about it, uh, uh, but it might be interesting. And they showed that birds and, and they, some sort of a parrot, okay, and they suggested that parrots, because they can uh, uh, imitate sounds of others, they are capable of generating this negative asynchrony. But, you know, oh, so I was, okay, well, this is, sounds very interesting, so I, I started to read a little bit of this, and what they did is they trained a bird to peck at specific, and they gave the stimulus in specific, uh, in, in fixed interval, okay, so the stimulus and another stimulus, and the, the bird was required to peck within this acceptable period, okay, so there was some time range. And if they managed to peck, before the stimulus, this is what we call asynchrony, the negative asynchrony, okay? So, um, and they claim that they managed to train birds to do so, and this is sort of the result. Okay, so let's forget about the solid lines because this is all simulation, but the two dashed lines actually shows a case where the bird actually had a preference for negative asynchrony, so it had some preference for pecking before the stimulus, and then there is another bird that also had some preference to peck, but after the stimulus, I mean, so this was a female bird, and then there was this male bird, I don't know what it means, but it's kind <laughs> of, uh, you know, these days we have to be equally represented, so. <laughs> yes, so that's, at first I thought these are all the females, 
an older male, but then uh, in the legend it's written, no, this was female B and then male B. And apparently three of the eight birds they trained had some tendency for t negative asynchrony, but it wasn't even consistent. Okay, so there is a broad distribution of reaction time. Some of them were negative, and uh, then they have some data, simulation, and so on and so forth. But what they have sh shown is that uh, birds might, at some time, in some cases, generate prediction of the stimulus, but not always, and usually not if they are male. Okay, so because <laughs> three birds were managed to do this, two of them were female, one of them were male. So I don't know about uh, what this is. It's true. Okay. So, so, so I have to be fair here. They said that the positive asynchrony suggests a very specific uh, phase relationship. But I think this is a little bit uh, to say that there is, uh, there is a fixed phase relationship. It's a little bit different than um, saying prediction. Random, random okay. So they, these are models of a different type of uh, processes. And one of the random process actually had a very similar prediction. So, you know, I, I, we shouldn't discount it so fast. Maybe I should read it a little bit more carefully. And maybe if it was in a, a little bit more prestigious uh, journal, I would even do it. But uh, it was, these were only, again, these were only uh, three birds out of the entire eight birds they trained managed to do any phase relationship. And one of them was had negative. So it's it's very weak. I mean, again, it's and, and the other thing, it's very inconsistent. So, are you familiar with uh, some famous snowball, the parrot snowball? Uh, snowball is the name of the parrot, or it's the species? Well known YouTube was musical instrument. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm like, a <laughs> I'm not there yet. Something like that. So, snowball can do it. Ah, it can actually. Music that they okay. It's used to listen to, but uh, changing the tempo, and they show that for periods it's well synchronized. I'm, I'm not sure. They don't talk about asynchrony, about prediction. Okay, but okay. It just but it can be synchronized. Movements yeah. are nicely synchronized with the prediction. Yeah, so they're talking about a, a parrot and elephant as animals that can actually get synchronized to some. And they try to come up with say that they have the mechanism because of uh, auditory, auditory yeah, auditory coming. But um, uh, often what you see is a very, I mean, in this bird at least, you see very broad distribution. In some cases they are negative, but in you know, it's not like uh, there is some synchrony, but it doesn't seem very uh, as strong as it is for for humans. But you know, again. Yeah. I know, they can do, the, yeah, but and it's not necessarily. 500 birds together can move almost instantly. Yeah, but that's not the mean, yeah, it's not yeah, yeah, it's not auditory. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely a sense of it's not yeah. it's not rhythm in any sense. Yeah, it's, it's not rhythmic. Uh, so yeah. Although they have the, okay. the movement, the, the, the wings. Many of the birds move in the many, many animals do synchronous music. Yeah. It's not, it's not predictive, it's not synchronous. No, it's a written algorithm. Yeah. So it, you can have inter-subject uh, uh, motor synchrony that is not necessarily related to time or to temporal. Uh, it's not time, but it's not auditory. Okay. But it's not. It's not. Uh, it's not a loop. I don't know if it's, it's not. A, a, I know. It's not clear whether it's auditory or not auditory. You know, it's like. A, well, I don't know because you kind of uh, when you walk, I mean, you there is also some uh, auditory part to your movement, but it's I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I, okay. Any other question? Um, still in short, and it's happening with the birds, and I have no idea. Uh, do we look at that when we the open yeah. the, the uh, Okay, so, uh -huh, yeah. Know? Yeah, you can train, I think you can train animals, I mean, you can train animals yeah. to do rhythmic movements, but it's not like, uh, uh, I, again, you know, I'm not so sure that it's not the same I mean, they, of course, 
they, can, they are capable of swimming, of making many types of rhythmic movement. But it doesn't mean that they actually can hear a rhythm and get entrained to that rhythm. Okay? So. I don't know. Yeah, I may, may, you know, I'm kind of, uh, I, I actually brought it as a sort of uh, uh, oddball. You know, it's like, ah, that's something uh, exciting and, uh, but uh, kind of, uh, I don't know if I can, go if I can uh, suggest any reason for, for, for this behavior because the numbers are so few that it's difficult to come up with some, you know, some species or gender differences here. Okay. But, so what I would like to talk is actually, what we are doing about trying to understand how the motor system is influenced by a rhythmic auditory cue, okay? So the question that we had is, what is the, these interactions? What is this coupling between the uh, auditory or the rhythmic input and the motor system? And we can think that the cerebellum, uh, we, 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 we rely on the evidence that suggests that the cerebellum is involved in this uh, allowing this rhythmic entra this entrainment, this motor entrainment to rhythmic cue. But the question is what, is, what is happening? So one option is that the cerebellum actually just sends some signals of time, saying now, you know, now, 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 and so on and so forth, and the motor system is being unchanged by this rhythmic context. But the alternative is that because the cerebellum is also part of the motor system, and it can affect the motor cortex and, but, and also the spinal cord, that the actual movement is being affected by the auditory context. So if you make a movement, if you make a finger tap, it will be different if the auditory context is rhythmic versus non-rhythmic. And that's sort of what we are asking in, in, in our work, is what are the context-dependent changes in motor output during rhythmic versus non-rhythmic movement? Okay, and this is just to show you the, uh, the, the system. So uh, this is representation of the motor system. We have the cortex. We have two cortical subcortical loops. Okay, from the uh, from the cortex to the basal ganglia and back to the cortex via the thalamus, and similarly from the cortex to the cerebellum, and then via the thalamus back to the cortex. Okay, and we. Okay, in a very general sense, we think that this loop is related to action selection, and this loop is related to timing of action. So it's like what and when, but the cerebellum here can affect the motor cortex, and the motor cortex is directly connected to the spinal cord. So changes of the motor cortex could affect the production of movement, but the, and the cerebellum is additionally connected to the spinal cord via the red nucleus, okay? So cerebellum can affect movement both uh, via the motor cortex, but also directly it, during, uh, via its impact on the spinal machinery. And it's kind of interesting to uh, mention here that evolutionary speaking, what changes is that this pathway increased dramatically with evolution compared to this pathway. So in humans, the importance of the cerebellum, or we, at least we think that the importance of the cerebellum is via its impact on the motor cortex, the primary motor cortex, and less, less so via the, this descending impact. But that's just uh, evolutionary. Still, the cerebellum have access to uh, muscles and that can change uh, movement in a, in a context-dependent ma manner. And we know from other studies People have shown that during with auditory trigger rhythmic movement, muscle activity becomes more regular compared to rhythmic movement that is not triggered by auditory uh, cues. So the actual auditory cues can change muscle activity. The muscle activity becomes more regular. There is a pattern of what we call a co-activation of muscles. That means we can be, uh, there is some pattern that is uh, helping us to be more precise. This is in human. Yeah, this is in human. Yeah. Uh, but this is a low limb and elbow and not in finger tapping. 
still. So there are changes. And what we ask is, what are the, what are the changes in the motor output when a per person performs different type of rhythmic movement compared to just random tapping, okay? So we train people to make just random tapping. We measure the acceleration, so the uh, uh, acceleration profile in the z-axis, okay? People were making this type of movement. And uh, we measured muscle activity of extensor muscles, okay? Extensor are those that are responsible for lifting the hand. Flexor are responsible for, you know, kind of dropping the finger down to the surface. And we gave people clicks and uh, measure the time of tapping. And the signal that we managed to uh, extract were the acceleration profile. So you see it's like uh, every time there is a tap, you can see this uh, uh, kind of signal. You, you see there is a specific signal of acceleration related to the tap that shows that the person was making the movement. And this is just the average acceleration profile in relation to the tap, and we measured also muscle activity. Now, between tapping, people kept their finger, their index finger, up. So there is always extension, okay? Between taps, there is always some sort of extension. And then, in order to make the tap, they flex the finger down, okay? Because we wanted to make it uh, constant across subjects. And this is just the extensor muscles, the flexor muscles, and this is just the pattern of flexor, you see that there is a flexor and ex there is a flexion and extension in each step, okay? Dropping the finger flexion and then lifting it up, uh, it's extension. So these are the different protocols. I won't go into this because it's not very interesting. And this is just to show that we get the same results. So this is the distribution of reaction time in random tapping. So we give uh, taps at ra the intervals are random compared to rhythmic reaction time. And here we have one hertz and two hertz. There is some differences, but I won't go into it. So I'll, we pull it together. You see that random, at, when the people are asked to generate tap uh, when, and the queue are given at random, they're also always reactive because they cannot generate a prediction, right? So and the reaction time is somewhere about 100 milliseconds or something like this. It's a broad distribution with a uh, long tail. But when you what was the distribution of the intervals? What was the, the distribution of the intervals in the random uh, Okay, so the distribution the was it uform? Okay, I, 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 yeah, it was uniform. I knew I, I need the, the student to be. Between what and what? Uh, that's a good question. No, because the mean is the same. Uh, I, 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 yes, I assume that there is, we can actually, yeah, we can measure it. I, I, I agree, but we didn't really, we just wanted to uh, uh, kind of, we, we were looking at taps where uh, the reaction time is. Uh, and the much longer than 200 milliseconds? Whew, I uh, cannot be, I, I think so. I, th I think, they are, yeah, I think they are like uh, longer than that, but there are some shorter and longer, I mean, so sort of a uniform distribution. At uh, some point, I knew exactly the, uh, the but that was. <laughs> is, this, is this a one hertz uh, tapping? No, this is both one hertz and two hertz tapping together, fully together. So it's a, ve so it's a very, very wide range of. Uh, how about this? Uh, well, this is for all subjects. It's not a single subject. This is a cross subject. So. Yeah, and it, c it includes the entrainment period. Yeah. Because it's, uh, it, it wouldn't be regarded by many people as a, as a baseline tap. Um, I, think I think the pair subject, it's much narrower. But when you, you people, different people will, you know, you, you'll, you'll have no, a little bit. You don't subtract the mean? No, no. Okay, okay. No, no. no, this is just the raw uh, uh, data. So, and you see that some ca cases, you know, people missed, you know, they, they didn't, uh, uh, they, they were reactive. So sometimes, some, you know, they, they take them time to generate the, the time frame. But generally, they are predictive, okay? Much better than the average parent, I think, okay? So it's like if this means anything, both male and female. So, <laughs> but... Uh, uh <laughs> No, 
No, I know, but uh, <laughs> I guess maybe this would be larger for the. This, <laughs> these are the main. <laughs> <laughs> we can give him a name, actually. No, but <laughs> okay. But the other thing that we saw is that the reaction time changes as a function of the task number. Okay, so uh, the people start to the first tap, the second tap, until the sixteenth tap, and this is both at random and in rhythm. There is some decrease of the. Uh, maybe there is some uh, people get you know, understand what, what the task, the reaction time gets uh, smaller. But for rhythmic, you see that after two or three tasks, okay, so after, sorry, it's difficult to see, but after like few tasks, they become reactive, okay? Uh, sorry, they become predictive, okay? So they start with, uh, you know, they don't know when the first step will take place, and, but very fast they become uh, predictive. And for random, you see, they never, of course, they never become predictive, but they, draw, they, they become more used to the, to the task. And they don't understand what to do. It doesn't become negative, but they also improve the situation. Yeah, there is some improvement. Because, you know, you, people at first, you know, they, they hear the first tap, they kind of, uh, maybe they thought about something different, maybe they, you know, they don't, it takes them time to get into this. Uh, you see that there is a larger variability here, too. There might be some learning, but the, you cannot generate a prediction. But I'll show you later what is the other changes that take place. Okay, there is some learning. Okay, that's it. Okay, we'll talk about this. But uh, then we gave also, even if you give them a self case, you ask people, okay, now generate tasks at at a rhythm that is comfortable to you. We don't dictate any uh, any specific rhythm. You still see that there is some decrease in the reaction time. People get, you know, it's, it's a movement. It takes time to get used to it. And then we also did some syncopation study. We wanted to see whether the, how much the auditory context affects the movement. So we, gave, we actually studied rhythmic movement under different types of auditory context. Random, rhythm, syncopation, which is rhythmic, but at a different type of, of context, right? And then natural IPI, where you still generate a rhythmic movement, but there is no auditory cue. The syncopation, the, the access of the x-axis with respect to the onset of the, of the stimulus, or with, uh, with respect to the midpoint? Uh, to the midpoint. Because it's very positive, as, as almost as a, a random, and, and we know that people can syncopate. Yeah. yeah. You, you probably, yeah, that's what I'm asking. Yeah. it's related to the midpoint or to the stimulus angle? No, 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 it's, rela it's related to the stimulus, I think, okay. because then, you, yeah, because you become, you become negative, yeah, yeah, so you become negative, sorry, sorry. Okay, the expected, uh, in syncopation of one hertz, you expect the interval to be 500 hertz. And then there is some negative asynchrony, some prediction in the syncopation that generates uh, something a little bit uh, earlier than the 500 hertz. Because you know that it should be 500 hertz, you become predictive again. I don't know, so syncopation means out of phase? Yeah. Systematically? Yeah, systematically out of phase. Not out of phase, but Neither in between. Yeah, anti-phase, anti-phase, yeah. Anti-phase. Anti yeah, not 90. I really don't understand the difference between the two things. Well, the, in, liter in the literature, people have suggested that syncopation is a high is a more demanding cognitive task that requires more cortical control over the, the movement. And it's not the same as just simple rhythmic movement where the cerebellum is the important uh, component there. That's why we measure. This is, according to the literature, this is a very different uh, type of task compared to the rhythmic. But then we'll, okay, so, but then I'll show you that it's not as different, yeah. yeah. Maybe it's a period yeah. of just uh, more or less I can move my hand, so it's actually quite a big change when I, my hand is up and down. So now you hear a sound, you have to, you know, you have to be in between sounds. It sounds, it sounds very difficult, and I think it is very difficult, and the problem is to keep the time frame, because people tend to uh, 
you know, to run away. You know, you see this, there, there, there are drift. People tend to drift and realign and drift and realign. It's a complicated, I think, co cognitively it's a complicated task. But for me, the interesting part is whether it's also different for the motor system. Because at the end, you generate movement at a at sort of fixed interval, more or less, okay? And that, that was the question. So then we looked at the uh, acceleration profile. And we found, we, we looked at the average acceleration, but we also looked at the coefficient of variation. Okay, coefficient of variation just measures how regular the movement is. So this is not looking just at the average, but how regular the movement is. Okay, how consistent the taps that you are making are. And we looked at a time window that was before the tap, 50 to 150 milliseconds before the tap. And what we found is that the acceleration profile is much more uh, irregular at random movement. I mean, you are making the same tap, but just before the tap, the acceleration profile is more irregular at random tap compared to taps at one hertz and two hertz. Okay? So movement at rhythmic to rhythmic use are more uh, stereotypical more regular, or, or not the movement, the pre-movement period is more <coughs> regular when you are making rhythmic movement compared to random movement. Okay. It's not pre-movement, it's pre-tap. It's pre-tap. It's acceleration profile, so it's not no. movement. Uh, uh, there is, uh, this is just before the movement. The, because, the, because the person is keeping his hand at top, uh, 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 Extended, there is also acceleration, uh, sort of negligible acceleration, even when you just keep your hand at, at one point, okay? At a sort of at a fixed point. But I'm not talking about the actual tap. So this is a little bit earlier. So it's before the movement has started, it can be defined as. Yeah, that's, that's, defined that's the problem. So it's very dif no, so we de it's very difficult for us to define the actual movement. But we took a time window a little bit earlier. But when we, okay. But when we looked at the EMG data, we looked at even earlier data, okay? When there is no actual movement-related activity. There is some EMG data that is related to the fact that you have to keep your hand fixed. And even at that, this is the extensor and the flexor, you get that at random, a random uh, tapping, the EMG is more variable compared to uh, rhythmic tap tapping. So there is something about the muscle activity, the movement, okay, the pre-tap period, and early EMG activity that suggests that the, uh, there is some higher variability at random data compared to rhythmic data. Okay, then we looked at self uh, at self-paced tapping when there is no auditory cue. We got the same results, even when there is no auditory cue. The uh, the CV of the acceleration, which is where, where it's very clear, but also of the EMG, okay, this is for the random data, it's much higher than the activity during the rhythmic movement, but also during self-pacing. So in a sense, the regularity of the acceleration and of the EMG is independent of the auditory cue. It has nothing to do with auditory processing, it's just that the movement, rhythmic movement are more regular. And that's also true Ah, oh, I'm sorry. I'm like I'm used to teach the physiology class, and I get confused that this is not a physiology class. Okay, EMG is the muscle activity. So we put electrodes, and the activity of muscles is basically has a, it's, it's electrical activity, and you can measure the actual uh, some activity of muscle that uh, in, in just below the electrode. Of course, ideally, I would have electrodes in the muscle, in the mu muscle, not the surface electrode, but in the muscle, and I'll be able to record single motor units, I mean, single muscle fibers, or activity of muscles in a very high resolution. But, uh, you know, subjects are very spoiled, students in the lab are very spoiled, they don't want to have their uh, muscle being poked, and, you know, I, I don't understand what I'm saying, it's like, but anyway. <laughs> Maybe I should offer more money, I guess. <laughs> okay, 
So self sorry, so self phase tapping in terms of the movement properties, the acceleration and DMG is similar to rhythmic tapping. And also syncopation. Okay, so syncopation was a little bit different. A little bit different. So we look at the C V of syncopation, this is during random and this is during rhythmic, one hertz rhythmic tapping. And this is the C V of the acceleration of syncopation. It's a little bit higher than the C V than of the acceleration during rhythmic, but it's not dramatically higher. And if you look at the single data, you see that the syncopation, this is the C V of syncopation trance versus the C V in rhythmic trance, it's actually very similar. And the C V of syncopation is lower compared to the C V of random trance. So syncopation, although people consider it to be a cognitive task that is, very, that is more similar okay, to random type of tapping, in terms of the muscle output, you are, uh, the, the properties are very similar. So in terms of the muscles, it's not important, basically it's not important what is the source of the rhythmic movement. It may take you different time to generate the time frame in syncopation, in self-pacing, or in rhythmic tapping. But once you generate the, the appropriate time frame, your muscle activity is the same. And the auditory cue doesn't matter, and the, um, the cognitive load doesn't matter. You generate a very regular type of activity. And the other thing that we found is that this the generation of this motor output is a sort of uh, gradual process, okay? So we look how, you know, the time frame, or the, uh, not the time frame, the, the, uh, uh, how the we, we looked at the process of generating the time frame, okay? So this is the tap number, and this is the, uh, the time. The, uh, of the, the, this is uh, basically the entrainment process. And you see, that the reaction time in normal rhythm takes a few taps and then becomes predictive. But then we ask people to uh, listen to the tap, sorry, listen to the cue, the auditory cue, and then join after a few cues that they uh, listen to, join to the rhythm. And we found that passive listening to the cue is sufficient to generate the time frame. You don't need you don't need to actually make the movement in order to generate the time frame. And I think this is sort of, that's why I, I told you that I, you know, somehow uh, there is some uh, perception action loop is, is, is a little bit vague to me here. Because you need to listen to, uh, in order to generate a time frame, but you don't need the motor action to be involved in that. I mean, that's sort of my thing. Okay, so I usually take this as an excuse, right? I mean, so, because, you know, you can always come say, but you imagine an yeah, action. But, but, but so, but this is different, no, you know. But, uh, but there is a clear cut experiment that shows the opposite. And this is a lab 2001. I told you. <laughs> no. Where it shows that, uh, that the perception has changed whether the people were tapping. He, he made a, a perception experiment and he showed that the perception threshold will change significantly if the people were tapping while doing the perception experiment. That that shows that that that, that, that maybe that, that at least some of the aspects of, of the perception are changed within the context okay. of Okay. Uh, this is I think okay. this might be a non-specific effect, right? I mean, it might be that you have some attention uh, uh, load. Yeah, but he showed that the cognitive load as a function of the parallel process has an effect, but a different. Okay. It's a different, it's, it's a different experiment. No, Maybe I know it's different. It's, it's not the same thing. Yeah, uh, but... It, it's not the same thing as a different... Uh, it's a different input. No, but this is not negating. It's just showing one example of, 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 of something that shows that No, this is a different story. I'm sure there are. In order to prove that there is independent chemistry, no. a lot of experiments showing every single one of them. Well, I mean, of, of course. I mean, we're kind of we are talking about a master thesis of a student. You know, she wants to go on with her life. You know, it's not like a, 
uh, <laughs> a process that could last forever. But I think that what it shows that there are cases, you know, I think actually it's sufficient to show one case where you can have them independent in order to suggest independence, you know? I mean, it's like, but we can argue about this later. I just want to, uh, okay, yeah. Let's but what we did see is that the process of change in the CV, the regularization of the movement, is a gradual process, okay? So if you look at the first 